Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, as yep. I was just saying to uh, George, last time I gave a talk, my internet failed halfway through. So I'm afraid if that happens, I'll tr try and get back in as soon as I can. Uh, I'd like to talk about um, quasi-linear modelling of the interaction of shear and convection. Um, so this is work I've been doing over a, a long period of time uh, with my uh, collaborator, Brad Marston, and with uh, colleagues, Jeff Cheney and Jeff Oishi. If I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some work I've been doing on exact nonlinear solutions for uh, a, a problem which looks at uh, the interaction of shear and convection. And that's been done with Tobias Schneider and uh, his former postdoc, Aisha Yezil at EPFL. So, uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different from some of the others. I'm not perhaps going to talk too much about wall banded shear flows. Uh, by training, I do geophysical and astrophysical fluid dynamics. And of course, in geophysical and astrophysical fluid dynamics, we can't do DNS. The Reynolds numbers are something like 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, something like this. So we need to go to reduced models. And for these reduced models, we usually need to make some kind of approximations. So I'm going to, most of the talk is going to be talking about something called a quasi-linear approximation and how we've been thinking about generalizing it. And we've been general, thinking about generalizing it in order to uh, try and come up with some statistical closures for, uh, for essentially large scale dynamical calculations. OK, so here. Uh, I guess pick your favorite movie. These are all geophysical flows. Uh, the one on the top left is uh, Jupiter. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about a very simplified model of the jets on Jupiter, which involves the interaction of shear and convection. The only thing I really wanted you to take from the movie of Jupiter is that uh, there are jets and there's turbulence uh, coexisting. And we believe that the interaction of the turbulence with rotation leads to the formation of these jets, these shear flows, and those shear flows act back on the turbulence, and it's a kind of self-regulatory process. Same is true of the jet stream on Earth, which is the thing you can see on the top right. Again, we have turbulence, we have large-scale flows, and the two of these things interact. This is a very natural situation, not just in astrophysics and geophysics, but of course, if you're looking at pipe flow or coet flow, you have the interaction of turbulence and um, mean flows. The one on the left is essentially my day job. I, I do quite a lot of dynamo theory. And dynamo theory involves, uh, is asked the question about the generation of magnetic field in astrophysical objects. Um, and what you're seeing there is the solar cycle. Uh, sunspots appear and disappear with an 11 year period. We have very organized behavior, large scale behavior, systematic mean behavior that emerges from a very turbulent system. And again, this is an example of large scale, small scale interactions, but this time I'm talking about magnetic field. But of course, one could talk about magnetic fields or flows or any, any state variable really, you can talk about the interaction of uh, means and fluctuations. In geophysics and astrophysics, the interaction of rotation with uh, turbulence and stratification is key and the reason it's key is it breaks the reflectional symmetry and when you've broken the reflectional symmetry usually in your turbulent system there's an existence of a pseudoscalar and this pseudoscalar uh, can lead to the generation of significant means be it a mean flow or a mean field if you are if you were a field theorist you'd say the existence of a of, of a of a pseudoscalar that's all there is to know once there's a pseudoscalar then um then, then you can say that mean flows are going to be generated. But that, of course, is, is perhaps, uh, we want to know a little bit more than that, really. So, of course, we'd like to go to reduced models, and you're all experts on how to construct reduced models from turbulent flows. And I've put down three ways you can look, uh, you, you could possibly look for reduced models. Uh, you could try and do some dynamical systems theory and try and calculate some exact nonlinear solutions to whatever flow it is you've got. And you think about these as the building blocks of turbulence. So there's this nice cartoon where your turbulence uh, is a kind of pinball machine where you ping around between these uh, exact nonlinear solutions. And I think these solutions are very interesting because I think they may provide a bounds on transport, be it transport of heat or perhaps uh, wall shear stress in wall banded shear flows. Asymptotic theories uh, is usually the exploitation of a very uh, large or very small parameter. 
So in uh, in turbulence, you might think about a very high Reynolds number limit, and there's some very nice work where you can derive uh, solutions doing an expansion in in essentially the inverse Reynolds number uh, by Phil Hall, for example, and collaborators. And usually these models are valid in some asymptotic wedge in parameter space. So in rotating systems, if you have a, rota a rapid rotator, then you could do an asymptotic expansion in perhaps one over the rotation rate, um, um, so-called uh, so Rossby number. Um, and often, interestingly enough, the validity of these models can extend beyond the formal limit of the theory. And again, these asymptotic theories, uh, sometimes they're quasi-linear theories and they again might provide bounds on transport. The final uh, type of reduced model that people have been interested in uh, recently, um, uh, by recently I, I mean probably the last 50 or so years, are statistical models. And of course these are derived to yield information about the statistical properties of the system or perhaps the statistical properties of unresolved scales. And usually they re rely on some kind of truncation or approximation. So you're all familiar with, say, getting a moment hierarchy and having to truncate the moment hierarchy as a description of turbulence. And that truncation is usually associated with some other um, approximation that you can think of in, in real space as opposed to statistical space. So I'd like to start off by saying I'm going to split the interaction of turbulence with means into two different sorts. So I believe the one on the right is the one that's more familiar, especially to those people who don't do geophysical and astrophysical fluids. So here's an example I've taken from John Gibson's website of, uh, of channel flow. So this is plain coet flow. And this type of turbulent interaction with the mean is where the energy is input uh, via mean flows at large scales. So because it's coet flow, we drive a large scale shear flow. That large scale shear flow, well, may or may not go unstable linearly, but there could be a nonlinear instability. Uh, it goes unstable uh, via some kind of uh, modification of the large scales. And then the, the unstable modes uh, interact with each other, cause turbulence, and that turbulence acts back so as to modify the mean. And of course, we're all uh, aware of different types of large scale flow, like these types of flow, like Kelvin Helmholtz instability, Taylor Coet flow. Uh, the magnetic uh, version of Taylor Coet flow is called the magneto rotational instability, and pipe flow and rotating Coet flow. The other type of turbulent interaction with a mean, which is very interesting for geophysics and astrophysics, is where you put energy at the small or moderate scale. So I'll show you a movie here. This is flow on a, on a spherical surface, and we're going to drive at moderate scales. You can see this happening here. So what I'm plotting here is the uh, radial component of the vorticity. And you get turbulence, and the turbulence interacts with rotation. And eventually, some order emerges into your turbulence. So you can see that the red positive potential uh, um, absolute vorticity is uh, just above the equator and blue is just below. And this is a signature of a strong zonal flow, uh, an equatorial jet. And this kind of interaction with of uh, turbulence with rotation causing uh, the driving of mean flows is, is natural everywhere. It's, it's uh, stars, planets, uh, disks, um, and in fact, we believe this similar kind of mechanism is at work for the large scale dynamos, the generation of magnetic field. So the approximations I'm going to talk about today, we've tried on both of these types of turbulence. And in some sense, the one on the left is harder to describe than the one on the right, because you need to get the correlations right to get the mean flows to emerge correctly. So I'm going to talk about uh, using these approximations for a problem where we're going to inject energy at moderate scales and see how the mean flows emerge. Okay. So, okay, let me talk about these approximations. So I'm sure you're, you've all heard of at least the quasi-linear approximation. Um, this has a long history. Uh, I think it goes back as far as Malchus in the, in the 50s, uh, who, who alluded to it, uh, but the first paper I know of that actually talks about quasi-linear approximation is in plasma physics by Vyadienov et al. in 61, and then uh, in the fluids context, uh, the famous paper by Herring in 1963. 
um, is, is a really nice one to read. So what 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 is the quasi-linear approximation? Well, you're all familiar with the concept of taking whatever state variable you have, Q here, I've called it, and splitting it up into a mean part. It could be a, a spatial mean, it could be a temporal mean, it could be an ensemble mean, plus a fluctuation. OK, from now on, we're going to think about spatial means, although you don't have to. The quasi-linear approximation involves keeping the interaction of a mean with a fluctuation to give you another fluctuation. OK, you keep the interaction of the me of a fluctuation with a fluctuation to give you a mean. OK, uh, and that's that kind of Reynolds stress driving a direct um, a non-local in spectral space transfer of energy, if you like. But you throw away the uh, fluctuation, interacting with the fluctuation to give you another fluctuation. Here, M's you can think of as wave numbers in the in the direction you're averaging in. So if you were doing a zonal average, these might look like waves like e to the i n phi, for example. And sometimes this term we're throwing away is called the eddy eddy nonlinearity, uh, e e null. Um, or sometimes in mean field electrodynamics, it's called the pain in the neck term, the pin term, because this is a term which is, is kind of hard to model. So as I've said, the quasi-linear approximation means we throw away these interactions. And of course, in throwing away those interactions, what you've done is you've thrown away the possibility of there being a, a cascade or an inverse cascade. OK, all the energy transfer is done by a means. And this is an exact approximation in certain asymptotic limits uh, where the eddies are sheared apart quickly by the mean flows. And I'll come I'll come back to that a bit later on. This is also an example of what Craigman called uh, constrained triad decimation. Pair. We're taking out triad interactions from, uh, from the system and we're doing it in a way such as we're doing it in pairs. And so because we're doing this, we can serve all global linear and quadratic invariants. So I said that these are often used for deriving statistical formulations and the statistical formulation of the quasi-linear approximation is sometimes called CE2, cumulant expansion at second order, or uh, in the papers by Farrell and Ioannou it's called stochastic, uh, stochastic structural stability theory. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about the statistical formulations. So of course this is an approximation, so how good is this approximation? Well, the effectiveness of the approximation is often measured by the Kubo number. So the Kubo number I've given you here, it's uh, for some reason it's called R and it's it's given essentially by uh, you take an RMS velocity, U in your system, you take a, a correlation length scale and a, and a turbulent uh, correlation time. And if R is small, meaning the flow, the turbulence decorrelates on a rapid time scale compared with an RMS uh, um, uh, time scale associated with the RMS velocity, then the quasi-linear approximation is a good approximation. Uh, of course, this is one of these useless numbers that you only know after you've done the calculation. Right? You do a numerical calculation, you find out the correlation time was such that, the, that you could have used the quasi-linear approximation but um, you've had to do the calculation in, in, in the first place. So just to stress again, if this approximation works, the mean only adjusts because of perturbation, perturbation interactions, and the perturbations only respond to the mean. So when is the Kubo number guaranteed to be small a priori? Well, there's very few occasions. Um, before uh, I talk about when it is, but it, it's a measure of how much energy is sent down the cascade or up the cascade, i.e. how much is done by local in wave number interactions versus how much is used to change directly the mean flow. So the Kubo number is guaranteed, guaranteed to be small if you're doing weekly nonlinear theory. Uh, sometimes if there's an asymptotic separation of time scales, um, you can get uh, quasi-linear type uh, equations, so you do an, uh, an asymptotic expansion and the equations you get turn out to be quasi-linear. So there are various different types, uh, examples both in geophysics, astrophysics and in um, shear flow analysis where you can do a, a separation of timescales and derive uh, quasi-linear uh, equations. 
or sometimes you just know that the turbulence is decorrelated on a fast time scale. For example, turbulence driven by perhaps supernova explosions. So the quasi-linear approximation works sometimes, but it has some drawbacks. And so a few years ago, we thought we would try and ex uh, generalize the quasi-linear approximation to something we call GQL. And instead of looking at uh, systems with a formal mean and fluctuations about this mean, what we decided to do was just separate things out into what we're calling large scales, uh, low modes, and small scales, high modes. So there's no formal separation of scales. Uh, spectrally, you can think of the low modes as having a low wave number. So they're all the modes with a wave number less than or equal to some cutoff value, which I'm going to call lambda. The high modes are therefore all wave numbers which are bigger than lambda. Okay. And so in this generalized quasi-linear approximation, we're going to keep the large scale, large scale going to large scale interactions. That seems like a sensible thing to do. In analogy with the uh, quasi-linear approximation, we're going to keep large scale interacting with small scale to lead to small scales. And we're going to keep small scale interacting with small scale going to large scale. OK, we remove all other types of interaction. OK, um, and in order to be consistent with being a triad decimation in pairs, you soon work out that actually you have to you have to remove all of these types of interactions. Critically, we're certainly going to remove the heart, the small scale, small scale going to small scale interactions. Uh, this is going to be important later on. Uh, so again, we're we're uh, throwing away the possibility of there being a, 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 a local in wave number cascade or inverse cascade. However, this is better than the quasi linear approximation because it's essentially of what's happening um, here in the middle. What's happening here is that you can scatter energy via the long wavelength modes uh, into other short wavelength modes. So let me give you an example. I imagine lambda's one. So I have a mean flow, which is uh, both a zero and one uh, mode, and I'm interacting with a small scale mode, which is two. Well, of course, the two can interact with the one to give me a three. The three can then interact with the one again to give me a four. So I can keep scattering energy between the, sh the high modes, the small scale modes off the low mode. However, importantly, for deriving statistical theories, the evolution equation for the high modes remains linear and quadratic conservation laws are maintained. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but you can also derive this approximation with an appropriate separation of timescale arguments. And if you're interested, you can have a look at this paper where we do that. OK. So how well does these things do? And we've tested this on, on a range of problems via just via direct numerical simulation, simply by hand, taking out the various different approximate, uh, the various different triad interactions. And we've tested them on many problems. Uh, some of which involve wall bounded uh, shear flows. So this is the magnetized Taylor Coet flow I was talking about. This is one uh, that I showed you the movie of uh, earlier. But the one I'm going to talk about today, sorry, we've done rotating Coet flow as well, for those of you interested. But the one I'm going to talk about today is this model of the driving of jets on Jupiter, which involves the interaction of shear and convection. Now, I don't really have time to derive the model, but I'll do my best in the time available to me in the final 10 minutes. But just to say uh, that there are two models for the for the driving of the jets on Jupiter. And the one I'm going to be considering today is the one where the jets are driven deep within the planet via convection. OK, so this is the one I'm going to consider. OK, so how do we derive the model? Well, this amazing picture on the left is is um, a numerical simulation of anelastic convection uh, in a spherical shell, rapidly rotating. Um, and it's a triumph of computational uh, astrophysics, I would say. Um, but it's very, very, very expensive. Uh, this was not done by me. This I've got this picture courtesy of Thomas Gustine. 
what you can see though, and this is really what I, I, I'd like to take from this, is that there's, there's an awful amount of turbulence. You can see the turbulent vortices. Because of the rapid rotation, because of the rapid rotation, the Taylor-Proudman theorem gives you structures that are largely independent of the uh, axis of the direction of rotation, right? And if I call this direction Z, then the structures you see are independent of the Z axis. And going way back to 1970s, 1976, Busser, Fritz Busser, used this property to derive a reduced set of equations. So he looked for solutions that were almost independent of uh, the Z axis. And I'm not going to go into details of how, how he did it. Essentially, what he did was he split his uh, velocity field up into something which was so-called geostrophic, meaning it, it largely didn't depend on the um, on the z-axis. So it was um, it could be written in terms of a stream function, just as a function of x and y. X and y are going to be local car, uh, Cartesian axes in in radius. Y is going to be radius, and uh, x is going to be longitude and plus a small perturbation and the small perturbation is going to be three dimensional so he's going to make the approximation that the perturbation is much smaller than the mean flow and he derives these two two sets of equations these two equations for the evolution of the uh, axial component of the vorticity and the temperature that's driving the convection so you can see here these two terms look just like the terms you get in 2d turbulence this term here is a thermal driving term. It has a Rayleigh number in front of it. We have a temperature equation, and this is the term which comes from the rotation. This is the term that breaks the symmetry that allows the development of mean flows. OK, I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the solutions of that system, both in the in the uh, quasi-linear and generalized quasi-linear uh, approximation and compare them with, mean, with the fully nonlinear solutions. So just to say, uh, what sorts of solutions do you find? Well, if you thermally drive strongly enough, you get convection. The convection interacts with the rotation to give you Reynolds stresses. The Reynolds stress drives zonal shear flows. Those zonal shear flows can act back on the convection and that can lead to a saturation mechanism. And actually you can get system, uh, you can get uh, a wide variety of behavior, including bursting, where the convection leads to Reynolds stresses, that leads to zonal flows, the zonal flows switch off the convection, so the Reynolds stresses switch off, so the zonal shear flows switch off, so the convection comes back again. And you can get this predator-prey dynamics between the convection and the zonal shear flows. So let me show you some pictures. So I'm going to show you three types of, of behaviour. The ones to look out for are the second panel and the bottom panel in these movies. This is going to be the zonal flow, the second panel, and the bottom panel is going to be the temperature perturbation. So you can see we get convection. The convection sorts itself out. It goes uh, with the rotation such that we're going positive direction at the bottom, negative direction at the top. And so this is a, a signature of a zone of a large scale shear flow. And so if we average over X and plot the result as a function of Y in time, this is sometimes called the Hofmuller plot, you can see We've got things going across at the bottom to the left, at the top to the right, and we've got a shear flow that persists for all time. And this is a large scale shear flow. If you change the rotation rate somewhat, uh, you increase the rotation, uh, you get behavior where you get shear flows, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, this scale is sometimes described as being driven on, on what's called the Rhine scale, and you get a number of jets. You can see here we've got a number of jets and in the Hofmuller plot we have uh, quasi steady they're, they're, they're really just kind of sitting there multiple jets so these are these are thermally driven shear flows and the final type of behavior we get that we'd like to try and explain is this predator prey dynamics so this is an interesting one there's an interesting mode interaction here. You can see here we've try, it's tried to have three jets, but they don't quite fit in. You can see this here. The three jets are going to give up in a minute, and we're going to go over to two jets. So you can see now we've gone over to two jets. 
and now these jets are coming and going. And so this is an example of the predator of predator prey type dynamics. The shear comes along, switches off the convection because there's, the convection's gone. There's nothing to uh, to generate the shear, and so the shear decays away again. So in my final five minutes, I'll talk a little bit about how well these approximations do in reproducing these, this behavior. And this is quite difficult behavior for a quasi-linear approximation to get right, because at least at the start, there is no mean flow to, uh, if, you, if you like, to perturb around. So you remember the first uh, type of behavior was that, uh, was that of deep jets. So what I'm comparing here are the quad generalized quasi-linear approximation with changing that cutoff wave number, that lambda, and um, so if I keep if I put lambda to be in infinity, then essentially I'm keeping all the modes and I'm doing a DNS. So that the top left uh, picture is the one I should be comparing with. The top right is where I set lambda to be equal to zero, and that's a linear approximation. And you can see, at least in this case, it gets the wrong number of jets. OK, so something has gone wrong with the quasi-linear approximation. By the time I put lambda equal to one, which means I'm just including one more mode as a large scale thing, I get the correct number of jets. Now, you may be a bit worried that the jets are reversed here to here, but this is uh, because of the Boussinesque symmetry of the system. This this uh, this uh, solution is equivalent to the other one. In fact, had I perturbed it the other way, I could have got the correct sign of jet. And of course, for lambda equals five, I've managed to get the correct number of jets. What about the more complicated behavior? Well, you remember I had this multiple jets here. Interestingly enough, again, here, the quasi-linear approximation, it does get small scale jet behavior, if you like, but it gets the wrong number of jets again. So again it's missing something. Um, but by the time I include again just one more mode in in the generalized quasi-linear approximation, I get the correct number of jets and the correct behavior. And again, I believe that this is because I'm including uh, the possibility of scattering energy between small-scale modes off a mean flow. My final type of uh, behavior is um, this bursting behavior. For this one, not only does quasi-linear theory fail, but actually the generalized quasi-linear theory fails at lambda equals one, but I actually get the correct behavior back again if I manage to put five modes in my large scales. So this one, this is quite very tough uh, type of behavior for, uh, for uh, any kind of approximation to get, to get correct. So why am I doing this? Well, it's really because I'm interested in doing uh, a statistical simulation based on this quasi generalized quasi-linear approximation. And so what, what do we have to do? Well, if I have the evolution of a state variable Q, which evolves due to a linear bit and a nonlinear bit, then my, um, and I split my state variable up into low and high modes like you've seen, then my evolution equation for my low modes, well, I'm keeping my low, low interactions and the mean of the high, high interactions. So in order to, to close the system, I need an evolution equation essentially for, for this, if you like, for the Reynolds stress. I have this equation now for the, uh, for the evolution of the high modes. And so I can derive an evolution equation for the, uh, essentially for the Reynolds stress, essentially because the evolution of the high modes is formally linear in the high modes. And that's my closure. OK, I have one minute left, so I just want to very quickly say uh, something that's probably closer to your heart than what I've been talking about. For the conve for convective problems, a central question is to determine the, the, the scaling of something like heat transport with parameters. Uh, this is a similar question, if you like, to the scaling of the wool shear stress or dissipation with Reynolds numbers. OK. And it's been argued that finding exact nonlinear solutions may bound, for example, the heat transport on convection um, or yield ideas about the scalings. 
And so what we've been interested in doing with uh, Tobias Schneider and Aisha uh, is to look for exact nonlinear solutions to the problem that I've just been talking about, this interaction of shear with convection. So what Aisha did was she took um, Daedalus. Daedalus is a generic pseudospectral PDE solver, which will solve essentially pretty much any set, set of equations that you like. And uh, we coupled it with the uh, with uh, N-solver, um, which is written in C++. So uh, the Daedalus is a time-stepping uh, code, uh, and N-solver will find invariant solutions such as equilibria, traveling waves, periodic orbits, and it will do continuation and stability analysis. And we've computed some of these large-scale shear flows. So here's an example of a traveling wave in uh, in the problem I've just been talking about, uh, convection in the Busser annulus. And so the idea is that we'd like to extend this to very high Rayleigh number and get the heat transport versus Rayleigh number scaling. And then repeat that for our quasi-linear solutions, because I believe that the quasi-linear solutions or the generalized quasi-linear solutions will give a bound Actually, they, they will be the uh, most effective. They will give the highest uh, Nussle number for Rayleigh number because, again, they underestimate the dissipation in the flow. And it's very important to get bounds for astrophysics. So I'm on to my conclusions. Just to say the quasi-linear approximation, it can be valid in cases where the Kubo number is small. But I think a better approximation is the generalized quasi-linear approximation which generalizes the definition of means to large scales and fluctuations to small scales. There are some open problems that we're trying to uh, understand. Uh, what is the role of different averaging procedures? Uh, for example, I've talked about spatial averaging, but of course you could think about ensemble averaging. So there could be an ensemble quasi-linear approximation. Um, can you uh, combine this with data-driven modeling? Uh, to essentially work out the bits we've thrown away and model those, perhaps using uh, neural nets or machine learning. Uh, can these approximations be used as a basis for the derivation of statistical theories? And I think this is this is a very interesting thing to do, is can we use these in conjunction with exact nonlinear solutions to find bounds for, uh, for these kinds of geophysical and astrophysical flows? So thanks for your attention and uh, I'll stop there and take some questions.